you sing, you are with me. You are with me. You are for me. You're not leaving, so I'm not folding. When shadows hover, you're still right here. You are my cover, I will not. I will not fear no Like the stars you will shine Brighter with the night Even in the darkness Your presence is a promise In the valley I know You won't let me go Even in the darkness Your presence is a promise over is a promise over me in my weakness you're my courage you will guard me you're my fortress your word is steady my solid ground you never left me you won't start Presence is a promise over me. You've always been there for me. You'll be there every time. Your spirit is my vision. Your promise is my sight. My God is ever faithful. Your word has taught me well. I will not fear the future if you're on. my 
my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Sing it out together. It's your breath. 
sing with all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sink when you sing
no shadow you won't light up, the mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. online community. So excited that you've joined us today. And I have some exciting news for you. God is doing a miracle within our church. And I wanted to share it with you. If you remember, uh, back at Christmas, we did a Christmas offering called Shine. Our whole goal with it was to uh, help enhance our ability to do online, do TV, do everything that we're doing, kind of just getting the gospel out there. Just do it better. Because um, we believe if we do it better, that means more people are able to hear about the gospel, the good news, have the opportunity to begin that relationship with Jesus. So here are some of the ones that came out of it. Uh, one, you may have noticed it the last few weeks, we've put up an LED wall that gives it just makes that whole experience better. Better at West, better at East, better at online, where we can do graphics, we can do notes, we can do so many things with that and make it look so cool. And so that was one thing. On top of that, uh, we're able to go live at all of our services now. So even the sermon you watch, that's live. That, like, that's happening today uh, and, and in that moment. So it's just crazy to be able to offer that to where it's, we're all having the conversation together. And uh, we've been able to add an, a staff member who focuses on the online community and making sure that you have the ability to connect with somebody. Because we think that's important. As much as it's awesome to be able to have you watch and, and take in what God is doing, we also know it's important for you to have relationship with people. We know that your relationship with God was never designed to be doing it by yourself. You need to be with people, and we want to give you that opportunity to at least connect with one of our staff members. His name's Kevin. He's an awesome dude. I hope that you'll be willing to reach out to him, maybe even make a comment right now to him and his team that is on Facebook or online. We'd love for you uh, to be able to do that. And, and then other pieces of this, studio. We've been able to turn some of the space that we had into a studio. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm able to film some of this stuff so that we can even reach more people through the content we're putting out there, helping them know what's going on within our church. And there's so many wins out of that. Now that's just some of the big steps that's happened, but in that there's so many stories. We've gotten notes sent in, we've gotten letters sent in of people just saying, thank you so much for offering this. Being able to watch this on the TV has changed my life. Being able to see this and families who couldn't watch before now are able to watch together and they're all over the United States, all over the world. 
making that possible. And one story in particular that stood out to me because I got to know this couple a little bit. Uh, wife was moving here to Rapid City, the family was, but they kind of had a crazy situation. She moved here earlier, got the job going, trying to look for a house. Housing market was crazy and so tough. He's in, still in California wrapping up things and then hopefully moving uh, to Rapid City. Well, because of our online option, he was able to stay connected. They both were watching the service together. She was going in person. He was doing, having the same conversations. And then they move. He finally gets here. And they're able to kind of, exp they already found a home church. To me, that's a big deal. When you move to a new place, that's a huge stressor. And being able to eliminate that, cause that to go down, and somebody plug into a church, make connections that quickly, is incredible. And these are just some of the wins. I know some of you even watching now, you're going, yes, this has meant so much to me. And that's because of the sacrifice of Fountain Springers, people willing to give. That's why as a church we say this is an act of worship. Because God gave so much to us. Don't forget this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And then Jesus ultimately, his son gave up his life for us. And so we learn to do the same things with what we have. Sometimes it's time, it's resources, it's money to where we can help other people learn about who Jesus is. That's why we give, that's why it's an act of worship. And I know for my wife and I, we give here and it's exciting to hear the mission that we're a part of, hearing the wins that come out of it, but it also builds a healthy relationship with God to where we're trusting Him and sacrificing for Him just like He did for us. And so to me, I look at this and going, it's such a huge step for everybody to take and we want you to join with us in this. So if you haven't given before, I encourage you to take the step, go to give.fs.church, go to the app, go to uh, our texting options, start taking a step now and move from nothing to something. For some of you, maybe you've given a few times, maybe you're going, I need to make it more regular, I need to make it more of a sacrifice for me. You take that step and know that you're joining a whole group that is on mission to show people who Jesus is and giving people as many opportunities as we can through our resources to let the gospel get out there. Let God be changing people's lives. Because remember, he wants everybody to be his children. He wants to be in relationship with everyone. And so as Christians, it's our responsibility to help them have that opportunity. And so thank you. For those of you who gave, thank you. But for those of you, even right now, you get to be a part of this. So I hope that you'll join us in that. Here's what I'd love to do right now. Just take a time and pray and thank God for what he's doing, the miracle that's happening. Because I think in the chaos of this world, be reminded that God is moving. God is doing some incredible things is important. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for the miracles that you've been doing through our online option and even being able to go into the TV realm and all those kind of things. And so God, right now, I lift up the online community to you. God, I pray that even the miracles that you've done already, may it just be these moments right now we soak in and go, God, thank you. But also we know that you have more miracles to do. You are having more moments with people. And so God, may we do our part. Since you've changed our lives, may we sacrifice, may we give every ounce that we can, whether it's time, money, resources, to help other people hear about you because we believe that you change lives. And so God, help us in that. Help us to be obedient to that. Help us to be faithful in that. And God, may we just see you be the God that we know that you are. Be full of miracles, um, full of life change. And so God, we love you. Thank you for who you are. And we look forward to what you're gonna do in the future. God, may you guide us. May you give us the courage that we need to chase after what you have for us. So God, we love you. Uh, be with us for the rest of this service. May we be ready to learn and grow in these moments. Pray this in your name, amen.
Hey, everybody. Hey, I get to do something uh, for the first time, and some of you are like, wait a minute, I think we've been doing this, but through, uh, through the use of technology, we've been able to do things delayed and whatnot, but I get to say, like, hello, hello, like legit today hello to uh, everybody at East. So everyone say hi to East. Hi, hi East. And, and every, everyone on the internet, hi, hi, internet. <laughs> It's weird. It's just weird. Uh, hey, we are a church that meets all over the place. We're comfortable with that. And, uh, and we've learned that what's, what unites us is God, specifically what you and I know about God. And so this time, if you're brand new to church, you're like, what are you going to talk about? What are you, what, like, is there a secret agenda to like, make us all drink Kool-Aid and wear specific sneakers and robes? No. Okay. So chill. Uh, my wife actually started us in a series that's uh, all about who God created. Specifically, uh, according to what we learn in Scripture, is God made male and he made female. And so what many of us think that the cultural debate is, which I will talk about this uh, the last week about gender stuff, but I think that we've found ourselves not necessarily just confused, but misrepresenting who God made and actually not even knowing what in the world it means to be uh, a man or a woman and how to do that the way it honors God. So we thought, let's pick a light topic and talk about that, you know? (laughs) Just kind of been in the mood lately to just see who will leave the church. I'm just kidding, just kidding. So to get to where we need to get, I need to tell you some history, not intending to get political, but you see, uh, James Garfield. Uh, If you don't know who James Garfield is, uh, one of our presidents. Uh, In fact, let me give you some stats. One, about 200 days into it, he was shot. That's the bad part. Uh, But you may not know this about James Garfield. From from what I understand, he's still the, the only president elected uh, that was also an ordained minister, like a legit ordained, not like on the internet. I have an opinion about that as well. Anyways, uh, he was like legit. Uh, also, you may not know this, he didn't technically run for president. I want to give you details. So, so the Republican convention, they began to, you know, on, if you know this, it began to like, On ballot one, right? Ballot one. Who's going to represent us? Well, apparently in that era, not everyone was on the same page. Some of us think this is new. It's not. They were not on the same page. On ballot one, James Garfield was not on the ballot. In theory, you and I are accustomed to those who run for president are intending to be president or would like to, or ballot one, he's not on it. It actually took all the way to ballot 36. And all of a sudden, a man is put into the position of eventually becoming president of the United States of America without the intentions of that day becoming president of the United States of America. Now, some of us might be like, oops, right? So many theories have been devised about how do you start the day going, yeah, I got some business meetings to go to. We're going to put some, somebody on the ballot to where when you go to sleep at night, you're like, I'm, on the ba- I, I'm the guy. Theories uh, like this one. This is a quote from him. Uh, I mean to make myself a man, and if I succeed in that, I shall succeed in everything else. Now, just because we live in a different time, he's not talking um, biologically. I mean to make myself a man, and if I succeed in that, I shall succeed in everything else. The conclusion that people have made regarding theories of how does a person like wake up going, I have no intentions of being president of the United States, and then eventually becoming president of the United States. How does that play out? Apparently, his, his way of going about life was, if I can be the man I'm supposed to be, then whatever I encounter, no matter what it is, POTUS stuff, 
But if I'm the man I'm supposed to be, then the rest of life, I will be able to engage that as it comes. Be a man. <laughs> Lots of people have different interpretations of what that is. Some of you immediately go, well, a man hunts. I'm not a man then. Uh, can we just, right now, your mind, as your mind begins to roll, like, a man. What, is it, what does it mean when you even think it in your head? Be a man. Or I'm going to be a man. And I think there's a lot of social constructs that take us down, I would say, rabbit trails that uh, aren't necessarily accurate and they're actually hurtful. I think uh, my wife did a great job at explaining that many of the things that, that uh, women are taught or at least are projected onto them that make you feel like in order to be like the right woman that you've got to do certain things at certain times in certain places and, and you've got to like even certain things. And, and she mentioned Starbucks, which we need to just stop with that. <laughs> but does it make a man like someone who hunts or is super strong or likes violent movies or, or likes motorcycles and engines? And, okay, I'm going to get distracted. But, but like, what, what is it? I think you and I should talk about this. And I actually would like to go further into this. And I want to go more after what makes a man of God. I, I think that's the better because if God made us, which I believe that he did, if God made us and, 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 and he's our creator, then you and I should actually go a little bit further and not just say, like, what is a man? What, what, is, it, is it okay if he wears pink? Yeah, like, which I have pink. There's a little pink. This is accidental. But, but, but you see the stuff that we come up with that we're like, yeah, you can't do that. Oh, now you can do that. What makes a man of God? Now, now I need to stop the sermon for a second. <laughs> because some of you ladies, you're like, man, I really liked last week's sermon. <laughs> and you might be wondering, like, why not save a sermon about being a man of God for Father's Day, right? Seems like a Father's Day kind of sermon. Well, every man is not a father. And actually, you know what I want? I want my kids taking notes. I want my daughter to have as good of a picture of what a man of God is as my son knows. If you're dating someone, uh, take notes. Because you might need to break up afterwards. Uh, <laughs> if you're married and you don't get that option, um, I still would like you to take notes. If you're raising a boy, you should take notes. If you lead guys, you should take notes. If you think basically a sermon about how to be a man of God is not relevant to you because of your God-assigned gender, then, then be careful with that because you and I actually need each other. We'll get there on the third week, but, but you and I need each other, which means you and I need to take notes on stuff that we might think does not specifically go after what we're going after, but, but whoever you are, you influence men around you or you influence boys around you, and you and I ought to have a very clear picture of not what culture is telling us of going, hey, you know, whatever you want it to be, I actually think God gave a specific information. And so uh, I studied and studied. The problem was that all the information that God gives us, <laughs> um, I'm going to need you here for about the next 24 hours. Uh, so then to be very open with you, is that God, where are, at least overarching, where are men really deficient right now? Like, God, if, if we could get into your head and, and know what's, what's one thing that men are not paying attention to, 
that if you and I, as, as, as men or those raising them or married to them or connected to them, what if we were to dwell on that for a little bit? So I'm aware that the sermon I'm sharing with you is going to be inefficient. It's, it's, it doesn't cover everything in all of the Bible. But I'm going to tell you, I really believe with all my heart that the one thing I have to share with you is where God believes we all need to give attention to. So without further ado, let's go to the Bible. Fellas and those around fellas. If you want to be a man of God, here, seek the kingdom of God above all else. If you want to be the man you're supposed to be, seek the kingdom of God above it all and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Fellas, if you needed tattoo stuff, you're welcome. If you needed, what do I do with my life? If you needed, how do I raise this young boy? What do I emphasize? Is it all about succeeding at a sport or learning an instrument perfectly or getting good grades? Is that what I raise my kids up to believe? Or is it, hey, choose whatever you want, whenever you want. Actually, you as the kid are the leader of the family. And I, like, what if you and I were to say, what do we need to teach? What do we need to know? And I would say, God said, I'm trying to tell you. The summary of this, a man of God makes life about God. You can live a full life engaging the people around you and by making life all about God. If you want to know the secret agenda behind the curtain kind of stuff, like what does it mean to be a Christian, specifically a Christian man? It, and again, this affects everyone, but specifically men, where are we most deficient? As a guy, I will confess to you what I've seen in my own life and other men's lives. We are really good at making life about not God. And I would like to be the messenger today that would say, let's stop that approach to life. Fellas, what if, what if you and I were to actually make our lives all about God? I'm not suggesting that you're going to be perfect at this. I'll be the first to confess. You will not be perfect at this. I am not perfect at this. But a man of God makes life all about God. Now, uh, I like to have someone peel that back because I'm like, so I leave church going, pastor said, make it all about God, and going to need more than that. So do I. Luke chapter 9. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? I know so many men right now who feel lost, feel destroyed. And if you can backtrack it, a lot of us, where, where we've decided it's the daily part that we stopped. We, we made the decision at some point to be like where we should be doing what we ought to do. But do you notice how it's, this is, Jesus is like, hey, take up your cross daily. Most of us are like, take up your cross. Yeah, I did. Like 10 years ago, I did it one time and woo, that was, that was tough. Take up your cross Daily, you and I drop the daily, and I think that is the deficit going on all over, specifically in the lives of men, and I would argue also, I think, in the lives of people in the United States of America and beyond. What does it mean to be of God? It basically equals unwaveringly faithful. This, this is the grand deficit right now. We are not unwaveringly faithful. We are faithful as long as, until, if. Whew. That's why I think, I think this sermon applies to everybody. Of God, unwaveringly faithful. If you remember, in the verse I read, he mentions, like, take up your cross daily. Basically, we're supposed to copy him. 
I don't know if you've ever seen a Roman cross. What's disappointing is if you go to Google, you're not going to find a whole lot of accurate depictions of crosses. Some of you are like, wait, my tattoo's wrong. It might be, but don't worry about it. Uh, uh, The actual example of a Roman cross is difficult to find. And just if you want to know why, it's because it doesn't match the religious symbol very well. And so you won't find a lot of those examples because it doesn't have the pretty perfect. uh, The Roman cross was about 300 pounds. 300 pounds. If you don't know the story of Jesus and what's crazy is how Jesus brings up, if if we want to follow him, we need to pick up our own cross daily. This is pre him doing the cross thing, which is like blow your mind kind of stuff. But he's like, oh, it appears to know what's going to play out. And, and so why I tell you about the Roman cross is some would say the Roman cross was, had, had two pieces. There was basically the, the giant pole, but then there was, there was the cross beam that would be nailed to you, you nailed to it, and then they would raise it up and hook it onto the cross or the beam and then nail your feet to the beam. You need to know what a cross was. It was considered one of the most gruesome, if not the most gruesome, painful, shaming ways for anyone to be executed. It was horrible. It was not glorified. It was not back then considered a tattoo or a beautiful thing to display in our homes. It would be like you and I going, look what we just set up in our home. It's an electric chair. It's absolutely beautiful. Don't you like it? You and I would be like, that's creepy. Right? They would have thought the same thing. You and I putting crosses all over the place going, what are you doing? But now it means something different. But what's important is Jesus said to everybody, pick up your cross and do so daily. You need to know that the weight of the cross, at least just the cross beam, probably would have been about 100 pounds. You're like, okay, I can carry 100 pounds a little bit. Jesus carried it with his back so whipped to shreds that you could see Muscle inside of his back. He was pouring out blood, nearly dead by the beating. Then they strap a beam to him. And he's supposed to carry that. And I have walked that path. It is brutal. It is up and down and windy and terrible. And I can't imagine being near death by a beating to do that. This is why so many people are not faithful. Because it's hard With that in your mind, let me take you out of a story of Jesus and tell you about someone who followed Jesus. His name's Polycarp. The story of Polycarp goes this way. He was drug into a scene, uh, much like if you've seen the movie Gladiator. Polycarp, was, and this is but just so we clear things up, this is not an actual picture. Uh, Polycarp is... Uh, is seized and, and escorted into the Colosseum. If you skipped history class, if you were brought into this environment on the floor ground that way, that was the worst thing that could probably happen to you. Polycarp was brought into there because he was a follower of Jesus. Polycarp uh, was discipled, we believe, by John in the Bible. And he was not only discipled by John, but he eventually, uh, as a follower of Jesus, is given charge of a church, the church in Smyrna. Uh, Now, here's the the job description given to this guy. And here's like, like, we we really want to make this convincing for you. Um, Like, uh, you're going to be persecuted like crazy when you lead this church. In fact, he was given a warning that we have in Scripture about this specific church. Uh, Don't be afraid uh, of what you're about to suffer. (laughs) When I was interviewed to be pastor of this church, that was not brought up. (laughs) Okay? Most of us don't sit in a first interview, and we're not told, like, hey, um, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Typically, we're like, we have a really good uh, medical benefit kind of thing. Like, hey, and we're very flexible on time and, right? Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. This is told to him as he's going to lead this church that's going to get persecuted. Most of us would be like, I'm out. Not the right job for me. Don't feel like God leading me there. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. 
<laughs> yeah. You will suffer for 10 days. Some of us don't like 10 minutes. But if you remain faithful, ooh. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Notice the reward isn't on this side of eternity. I think that's what got some of us challenged with our faithfulness is we're looking for our rewards all around what we can physically see right now. And notice the promise is, hey, you're going to get persecuted. One, uh, it's going to be bad. Um, you're probably going to die. But hey, the reward will be after you die. So Polycarp is ushered in to the Colosseum. What you need to know, though, is what precedes this whole moment because it's pretty cool. Uh, cool and, well, now that we know the whole story. Uh, so the way this works is Polycarp is uh, arrested, or grabbed by some bounty hunters. That's how, I mean, still, it's not a new thing. It was by bounty hunters, went to go find him. And what, what gets me is Polycarp had been warned that bounty hunters were on the way. Now, if bounty hunters were on the way for you, can we just all confess one thought in our head would be like, they ain't going to find me. Like, I already got a plan. Uh, what's interesting about Polycarp is, if you want to know where they arrested him, in his house. Here's how it goes down. As they show up to the house, even he got, he's got friends and family going, run, run, like they're coming to get you. He even takes the bait a little bit and goes to a different house for a little bit, but then he's like, ah, no, I got a vision from God, goes back to his house, and the bounty hunters show up. And that's maybe where, you, you know, like Polycarp's last stand, right? No. He says, come on in, I'm gonna make you a meal. What? Bounty hunters, come in. Makes them a meal. As they're eating, he says, I have one request, if you wouldn't mind granting my one request. Uh, may I have one hour of prayer? What would you pray in that situation? I can tell you what I would. God, kill the bounty hunters. <laughs> what gets me, history tells us that after he got done praying for an hour, and of course they had to hear his hour of prayer, those bounty hunters decided to follow Jesus that day. Now, you may not like this, they still had a job. And if they didn't fulfill their job, they were gonna get killed. So they said, all right, we wanna know more about Jesus, we got time to talk. And they escorted him back towards the Colosseum where he would face his death. He's ushered in on a donkey as they take him in. And as he enters the town, most people know why he's coming in. And so they began to yell at him, like, we want you to die. We can't wait to watch you die. The leaders of that area actually began to say, if you'll just recant your love for Jesus Christ, I'm paraphrasing, but if you'll just say that Jesus isn't the Christ, if Jesus isn't the Son of God, we will let you go, man. As he's thrown into the Colosseum, it's detailed because historians all around, because they document all of this stuff in a really crazy way, it's said that Polycarp heard an audible voice of God, be strong, Polycarp, play the man. Ooh. In the midst of this, they're yelling at him. You've got a group of people going, let the, let the beasts out. Let the beast out. Let's watch this guy die. Then you've got the leaders in the Roman area there going, if just renounce your Christianity. Renounce it. And then uh, they give up. And three times it's announced to the whole group, Polycarp says he is a Christian. Polycarp says he is a Christian. Polycarp says he is a Christian. They turn and look at Polycarp and say, renounce it now and you're free. And he says this, 80 and six years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. Some of you are like, wait a minute, man. <clears throat> I think God has done you wrong. You're about to die. Notice his perspective. 
He has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Who saved me? He's not talking about out of death right there. He's talking about his soul. So the crowd is crying for the lions and the tigers to devour him. The leader decides, no, we're going to burn him to death in front of all of us. The way they would do this is they would actually crucify the person. Same what I just told you. They would take the actual beam, that cross beam, and they would nail you to it. The reason they would nail you to the cross beam, because as soon as they actually light you on fire, you know what most of us would do is try to get out of the fire. So as they're laying Polycarp down to nail, you need to know what Polycarp told them. No, you don't need the nails. I'm not running. So they actually do not nail him to the cross. They just tie his arms. They set him up on the beam and they light him on fire. But then they ran into a problem for some weird, strange reason. He's not dying. At this time, it's believed there would have been other Christians already on these poles burning to death, and the smell in that environment would have been absolutely disgusting and horrible, and you would always remember it. But the way the historians say that as soon as they lit Polycarp on fire, the smell in the Colosseum immediately changed, and what they've written in the history books is all of a sudden the smell of frankincense filled the Colosseum. If you don't know about the smell of frankincense, uh, enjoy yourself, go to Christmas time a little bit, and you're going to learn one of the gifts brought and presented to Jesus. All I'm doing is telling you history. They got a little upset that the fire did not seem to be doing what they wanted the fire to do, so they, they decided to kill him with a spear. And he utters these words as he's dying, I bless you because you have thought me worthy of this day and this hour to be numbered among you martyrs, your martyrs, in the cup of your Christ. This is a faithfulness that I believe God would like to bring us to. Here's what I know. I can now speak in such a way. I've been a pastor long enough. Here's what I know. Right now, at all of our locations online, everybody with me, here's what I know. Some of you are contemplating staying in your marriage. Some of you are contemplating actually staying at your job, staying as a parent, staying at whatever it is. You're wondering, should I continue to do what I committed to do? And what I would tell you specifically to you men, you are called to faithfulness. So let me give you some obvious stuff and then we're going to finish. Faithfulness requires sacrifice. I know you know this. I'm writing the sermon going, duh. Come on, David, you went to seminary. Come up with something different. And usually when I think that way, God's like, "Mm, I need you to stop that, David. Faithfulness requires sacrifice. The reason I think we need to have this is we need reminded of this because what's gonna stop you typically from being faithful is an unwillingness to sacrifice. Now, some of us are like, but I'm going after, I'm going after this, I need this. And, and, and Howard Hendricks says this, and I thought this was brilliant. It is required, it is required of a man that he be faithful, not successful. This hits us in the gut because many of us, specifically as men, think our God-given charge in life is to be successful. We feel it in our guts that we ought to be the most successful. And I mean, early on, whether it be the sport or the band or the whatever, we've got to be successful. Then, then all of a sudden comes dating. And you're like, I got to be successful at this and, and marriage and then parenting and, and then my job and, and then everything. And then you look at like, what's in your bank account and, and what kind of things do you own and, and who knows you and what kind of rank do you have? And, and for men, we buy this cyclical lie of you're not successful. You need to keep trying harder to be successful. All the while we get muted is be faithful. Because when you are pursuing success only, you know what you're not going to be? It's faithful. Many people right now are pursuing success 
And they think it's called faithfulness. You are, I'm doing this for, I'm doing this for, I'm doing this for. Meanwhile, we're abandoning our role as dads, husbands, friends, Christians, employers, go down the list. The Bible gives us multiple examples of this. I'm going to show you just a couple. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances, uh, for this is God's will for you to who belong to Christ Jesus. So let me just, let me cut to the chase here. If, if you need this polished and nice, I can recommend some other places. But here, but be thankful in all circumstances. I want you to, no matter what circumstance you're in, as tragic and horrific as it is, you are still called as a Christian to find some way to be thankful. And you're like, how do I do that? When God's not doing what I want him to do. When he's not fixing them, you stay faithful. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will. So many of us are like, what's God's will, Pastor David? I need to know what his specific will is for me. And I can look at you and be like, to be faithful? You're like, I was hoping for more details on that. I understand. But let's start with the big picture. Be faithful to whomever and whatever God has called you to. There's, there's more. Uh, so if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, <laughs> run! No, just kidding. Uh, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, quit! No, no. okay, I'll, I'll figure this out. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, if you're suffering, if you're suffering and it pleases God, keep on doing what is right. But culture tells me something different. What if I'm suffering in a manner that pleases God that could harm me? What if, what if I'm suffering in a manner that pleases God that doesn't let me get paid what I deserve to get paid? What if suffering in a manner that pleases God makes me not really thoroughly enjoy my marriage? What if suffering in a manner that pleases God means that I don't like my kid right now? Keep on doing what is right. How? And trust your lives to the God who created you for he will never fail you. If you don't know how to read the Bible, sometimes we've got to read it backwards. If you don't want God to ever fail you and live in that, you've got to trust the God who made you. And many of us, the reason we aren't faithful, because we don't trust him. We encounter a situation and we're like, oh, no. I can't fix it. They can't fix it. This isn't working out. So it must be my sign. And God's like, yeah, you're signed to be faithful. You know what this means? Very simply, uh, faithfulness is a constant choice. If you're trying to resolve, okay, for the rest of my life, I'm going to decide right now that I'm going to be faithful. And this is the last time I ever have to decide that. Uh -uh. I believe it's a daily, multiple times during the day. Will you be faithful? I used to work for Big Brothers Big Sisters when we lived in Kansas. And I spent my days as a case manager going house to house to house, meeting with families who were wanting a, a, a young girl or a young boy to be matched up with a mentor. And I, I, I have lost track. I lost track of the amount of time someone said, I just need someone to choose my kid for once. And so I would find random volunteers, take them through a background check and an interview process and link them up with some, their kid with someone they're not related to. But this volunteer's decision was, I will show up. Men, it's not just a physical thing of showing up. It's a mental thing, a spiritual thing. Show up. So let's peel this back more because your pastor did not do well in school and needed things more thoroughly explained. Faithfulness requires focus. If you want to know, why do I struggle sacrificing? Why do I struggle being faithful? When I, maybe you've got your own stories, your own war stories of like, man, I, I actually did it. I betrayed that person. I left that and I quit that. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? It's not that something's wrong with you. It's that you perhaps lack the focus. Scripture teaches this. Uh, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. No one, no one. If you're thinking that you can, can we just, can, 
Some of you are overachievers type A. You're like, oh, I bet I can't. No, you can't. No one can serve two masters. No one can. Words of Jesus. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. If you think this is only about money, it's not. Let me show you an example in an article that talked about the virtues that typically men are trying to figure out which direction they're going to go. And, and if you're at a fork in the road, let me show you something. I thought this was really good. I'm summarizing a ton of information here, but some of us are going after what's called resume virtues, uh, where we're like make a living. Again, like, like your rank and your money and, and, and what's, what you've got and who's around you. Celebrated by culture, by the way. Like, hey, like do everything you can to make yourself represented. However, eulogy virtues, for those of us who are at funerals a lot, uh, I'd suggest making a life is a better pursuit. And there's a difference. Celebrated at your funeral, where we will talk about your faithfulness, not the car that was in your garage. So where do we land? Well, I want to get into your business. So you may not like the next few minutes. This sermon brought me to a question. Who is helping you become a man of God? Please note the details of, I'm not asking who is helping you become a man. There's plenty of people signing up for that option. Who is helping you become a man of God? And if your answer right now is, I don't have anyone. I would like to sign up. I would like to be in your life and help you be a man of God. And guess what? I will, in the process, if you want to be a part of it, introduce you to other fellas who would like to help you as well. If you don't have a list, that's not other people's fault. So here's what I want to do. Uh, if you're at uh, East Shoot, if you're online, unless you're in a car, don't do this, but. If you'd be willing to let me pray for you, but ah, let's go a little bit, that's, no. If you'd be willing to commit to being a man of God, whatever it takes, whatever it includes, if you're like, I want to be a man of God, I don't, know, I don't know all the details, David, well, neither do I, but we'll figure it out together. If you're willing to be a man of God, I would like to pray for you, but I don't want you to do this secretly. So wherever you are, however you're listening, and you want to be a man of God, stand up so I know who I'm praying for. Now everyone at whatever location, I want you to look around. And the guys aren't going to like what I'm about to say is I want you to hold these guys accountable. If you see them, the next time you see him, say, hey, what'd you do about that? You stood up. I saw you stand up. You're not judging them, by the way. I'd say it to my kids. Hey, you said you'd study. Did you study? Men, our world needs you to be a man of God. We don't fix the problem in D.C. We fix it here. So I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, every single man who has stood up, wherever they stand, God, I pray that you would enter their lives in a way that they are asking, that you would empower them, that you would strengthen them, that you would guide them, that you would give them wisdom and discernment that they crave to know how to actually follow you to make life all about you. In the name of Jesus, I command all evil that has set traps up for these men, that you will... You will let those traps be sprung and moved out of the way. God, I pray that you'll protect them and their families as they're dating, as they're married, as they're raising kids, as they're working, as they're leading, as, as, as they suffer wherever they suffer, God, that you'll be with them and walk with them and guide them. God, would you help me and the pastors of this church and the men of God of this church to unite in such a way, Lord, that, that we would actually spread the gospel in ways that it needs to be spread as representatives of yours. 
So Lord, I ask that you would anoint every single guy standing. And God, would you use them to help others know who you are. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. What an incredible message. And fellas, I hope you feel challenged. Um, God has called us to be men of God. And, and hear me, it doesn't mean that we have it all figured out right now. But we go on this journey of learning how to become the men that God designed us to be. And so here's the thing, we wanna help you in that. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna do uh, this coming week is September 22nd, we're gonna do a lunch. So fellas, you're invited. Uh, we're gonna do it at East. It'll be from noon all the way up to one. Lunch will be provided. We just wanna connect with you and help you in this journey and give you some dates of things that will be coming up uh, here in the fall, but also uh, even at the beginning of next year. So that way we can all go after this. So I'd encourage you, take that step, join us in this. Um, and if you just need to reach out to have some questions about even the sermon or anything, don't be scared. We'd love to connect with you. You connect with me, you connect with Chris or even Kevin online, love to be able to do that. And on top of that, we've got another thing coming up. If for all the married couples, we've got marriage night happening. And so we just got some events happening that we want you to be a part of. So if you haven't signed up for that or uh, just married, you're wanting to be getting better, getting healthier, encourage you to come to this. It'll be September 24th, tickets are available. You can go to marriage.fs.church and you'll be able to see that. And so thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a good week and hopefully you'll be able to connect with some of these events. Digital and consistent giving has never been easier. It's as easy as sending a text from your phone. Simply pull out your phone and text the word GIVE to 605-299-8374. It's as simple as that. Thanks for helping us make a lasting impact in the Black Hills. Here at Fountain Springs, we believe in the next generation. We want you to know that we've made it easy for your kids to engage in a service that meets them at their level. There are three easy steps to take to access these services. Step one, download our app launch your preferred app store and search for Fountain Springs Church. Step two, once you find it, download and open the app. Step three, on the front page, you will see an icon titled Kid Services. Just touch that image and pick the service for your appropriate age group. We have a service designed for preschool kids and a service designed for elementary kids. It's as easy as that. We hope your kids enjoy.